the book of Ephesians chapter 1. We've read this now three weeks in a row and it should be becoming familiar to you. I want to talk about how it is that we can glorify God. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But read with me. Ephesians chapter 1, the first 14 verses. Paul, an apostle, that means he was an ambassador, a representative of Christ Jesus by the will or the authority of God. To the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realm with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be holy and blameless. Adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loved. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sin in accordance with the riches of his God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were, made, you were marked in him with a seal the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are Christ's possession to the praise of his glory. There are words, there are phrases, there are concepts in the Bible that we use frequently that oftentimes we don't know the meaning of, the full meaning. We don't grasp it because we haven't taken the time to study it. Such words as sanctification, justification, glorification, all those other Icatian words that we use and we don't quite grasp what they are. And the word glory, I think, is one of those words. It falls into that category. Glory is a word that we use, we just sang it. But if I were to give you a pencil and paper and give you a test and say, define glory for me, a couple of you would fail the test. In chapter 1 that I just read in verses 4, 12 and 14, the apostle tells us that we are redeemed and we are built up spiritually to the praise of God's glory. And I'd like to take the next few minutes and let us examine what the meaning of God's glory is and if possible kind of determine do we contribute in any way to it or what are the benefits that we derive from God's glory. According to Zondervan's Bible Dictionary and a couple of commentaries that I looked at both in the Hebrew and the Greek the word glory has essentially the same definition. It refers to the honor and the dignity of glory of God. It speaks of acknowledging all of that which makes him impressive and someone of importance. Glory includes all the things that make someone important and admirable. And so when we read in the Bible about God's glory, we speak to something to do with the praise of his glory. It always has to do with his character. It honors him. It, it talks about making him imposing, impressive, and it deals with his character, who God is. As an example, if you go to Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, you'll find the event where God met with Moses on the mountain, Mount Sinai, and there he was being given the Ten Commandments. 
And after and before, after he gave them to them and before he left, God said to him, said of himself, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. All of those words there describe who God is. They, they, they speak of his character. They speak of his nature. They summarize the totality of who God is. He is loving. He is compassionate. He is gracious. He is slow to anger. He forgives sins. He is faithful. They speak of who God is. We're exposed to who God is in the first chapter of the book of Genesis. There it says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And there is a Hebrew word, grammar word that describes what happened there. It's the word duvar. And it means that God created all that he created out of substance, out of nothing. He didn't have the atoms and the molecules. Those, all those things didn't exist. He simply spoke and the heavens and the earth came into being. Gives us an idea of who God is. In the second chapter of Genesis, we are told that from the dust of the earth, God created man. He created Adam and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. That which God is, is the source of life. He is the creator, the sustainer. In Jeremiah 32, 27, we hear God say, I am the Lord God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? And I don't know if you've ever had a smart aleck ask you the question, well, can God make a rock too big that he can pick up? Have you ever had that question asked you? I have. Well, I want you to know when you consider, when you consider the... Uh, uh, the, the plagues of Egypt and you consider the, the dividing of the Red Sea and you consider the fact that God fed several million people for 40 years, man, manna and quail. The answer is an emphatic, no, there's nothing too hard for God. There's nothing too hard for God. So the glory of God involves who he is and all that he's capable of doing. And then God's glory also demonstrates what he owns. In Psalm 24, it says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world, and all that live therein. In Haggai chapter, chapter 2, verse 18, it tells us that all of the silver and gold belongs to God. In Psalm, 20, Psalm 50, verse 10, it tells us that the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to God. So with all that in mind, I think it's appropriate for us it's appropriate for us to recognize and acknowledge him as creator and sustainer. And the Apostle Paul says that it is in him that we live, move, and have our being. He is the sustainer. It is in him that we live and move. And so daily, in our daily lives, we ought to acknowledge that. We ought to find some occasion, some event, some opportunity to just pause for a moment and say, How great thou art. I've watched the... Terrible scenes that we've seen on TV for down in Texas and my heart's been broken and, I, and I've sat there and, 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 and said, God, you have spared me and you've been so good to me and to my family. I'm utterly astounded at your kindness to me because of, his, of who he is and what he owns and what he does. It seems appropriate for us to bring glory and, and, and his glory reveals who he is and what he is and, and what he can do and what he owns. And, and in the light of that, I think there's an appropriate question to be asked. It may seem like a trite question, but I think it's an appropriate question. And it's this, considering what it cost, how then does our redemption, our salvation increase or contribute to God's glory, to his honor? And to his praise. And I would like to offer three answers to that question. Because I've pondered that for some time. The first way that we can bring glory to God. And that contributes to his glory and his honor and esteem. Is for us to do what I said a moment ago. For us to praise him. To open our mouth on a day by day. And say thank you. You are worthy. You are honored. I honor you. I glorify you. I praise you. I worship you. You alone are worthy of my worship. Daily do that. 
We can honor and pray, and it brings glory to him. Thank him for our life and our health and our strength. Thank him for our family. Thank him for meeting our needs. Thank him for this church family. Brings honor and glory to him. To acknowledge his power, to acknowledge his grace, his mercy, to acknowledge his love that has been exhibited to us. As I grow older, and I am growing older, I become more aware of how remarkable it is that God loved me enough to forgive me of my sin. How remarkable it is that God loved me enough that he chose to forgive me and he chose to make me one of his children. That's, that's, that's remarkable. And the older I get, the more I become aware of how remarkable it is that God gives me peace, gives us peace in this very troubled world. Peace of heart, peace of mind, to be at peace with God. To know that there's no, that there's no antagonism between ourselves and God. That we have trusted in his son. We've accepted forgiveness. We've asked for and accepted forgiveness. And there is peace that passes all understanding and joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. I, am, I, I stand amazed at that. There's a second way that we can bring glory to the name of God. And I think it's, it's, it's allowing him to change us. To change, to change our lives. History has demonstrated for us, if you read any history at all, you know that history demonstrates that only God can bring about real, meaningful change in a man's life. All of the how-to books that has been written cannot do what being born again will do in just a moment. Being changed from death into life from being blind to being able to see, being an enemy of God to being a child of God. There's, he brings it about by the Holy Spirit. You remember the guy named e Jacob? As in Jacob and Esau? They were brothers. Jacob's name meant deceiver and supplanter. And why you would name your son Jacob is beyond me. But he turned out to be a guy who was constantly looking for a way to enhance his position. He was looking to come out of the top. And yet, through an encounter with God, through an encounter with God, the man became so changed. His nature, his character became so changed that God changed his name from Jacob the deceiver to Israel, the one who struggles with God. And then there's a guy named Simon. He was a fisherman. If we have any idea about who he was, he was sort of loud and he was probably hot-headed. But when he encountered Jesus Christ, his life was so dramatically changed that Jesus changed his name from Simon the Pebble to Peter the Rock. And then there was a man named Saul of Tarsus, brilliant scholar, brilliant member of the Sanhedrin, persecutor of the church. Hated Christ, but when he encountered the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus, so changed was his life that his name was changed from Saul to Paul, an apostle, an ambassador, and servant of Jesus Christ. And then there's John Newton. You know about John Newton. He was a slave ship ship captain. Violent, cruel, brutal. So much so that when the, the authorities heard that he was headed their way. They'd meet him at the, at the outskirts of town and say, you're not welcome here. But when he came into contact with Jesus Christ, he was so changed that from a slave trader, from a brutal man, he became a pastor, mentor to many, and the writer of the hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. That saves a wretch like me. He was talking about himself. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. The change that I've just noted in those men's life is, is more, more than just a change of their name or their, or their occupation. It was a change in their very souls because they came into contact with God. And so I believe it's easy or it's appropriate for us to say that the greater the change in your life and my, or my life, the greater the glory that God receives. The greater the change in your life or my life, the greater God is honored and God is praised for what he has done in our lives. 
C.S. Lewis wrote, and I quote, as far as we know, it costs God nothing at all to create all that is beautiful and attractive about this world, but it costs him the suffering and the death of his son on the cross to change the rebellious hearts of mankind. Change brings glory to God. Change brings glory to God. And the third way that we can bring glory to God is that we can allow him to bring about and to use us for his honor and glory. Become instruments in his hands for his honor and glory. You see, I'm personally convinced that God doesn't just want to do something for us, to us, and in us, but he wants to do something through us, through us. He wants to work through us and to do so in such a way that, that whatever is accomplished is so obviously his doing that he is honored and glorified as a result of it. That's why I think the scripture tells us that it pleases God to use the weak to confound the strong and the foolish to confound the wise. I think he chooses to use those of us with limited skills because when great things are accomplished, it's obvious it's not us that's doing it. It's him. And why does God work that way? Does it please him to see us struggle? Does it please him to see us weak and insufficient? And the answer to that question is no, a thousand times no. I believe it's God's purpose. I believe it's his heart desire that we should learn to trust and lean less and less on ourselves and more and more on him. I think he wants us to be less concerned about our importance and more attentive to who he is, what it is he can do and what it is he will do and for us to speak more and more enthusiastically to others about what it is that he has done. Psalm chapter 8 verse 1 says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It speaks of his majesty. O oh, Lord, our Lord acknowledges that he is Lord and that he is majestic. They acknowledge who he is, those words do. And so this morning, I hope, I pray that uh, we will begin to look for ways, deliberately, consciously, purposely, look for ways to bring honor to God to bring honor to the name of our Lord in our daily lives. That we will look for the ways that we can allow him to use us, to change us if that's necessary, to change our nature, to change our behavior, because if we allow him to do that, the result is going to be that God's name is going to be honored, kind deeds are going to be performed, and service is going to be rendered all to his name and to his glory, to the praise of his glory. God is good, isn't he? All the time, God is good. He wants to use us. I know we're getting old. I have a birthday this month. I have a birthday this month, and I'm not looking forward to it because I'm going to be as old as a couple of others of you here. <laughs> but I want you to know that the fact that you're sitting here this morning that you're alive and that you're well enough to be here and that you desired and you wanted to come to the house of the Lord is cause for us to give him praise and honor and to thank him. Because I know a few folk in our congregation who would love to be here this morning but can't be. Can't be. But to the praise of his glory, we're here. And we've been able to sing and we've been able to pray and we've been able to meditate. And you've heard me rail on now for 15 minutes about God's glory. Don't walk out of here this morning and forget it. This week, praise him, would you? Thank you, Lord, for these moments together. Thank you for this time of song, of prayer, of thanksgiving. Thank you for our guests. We've not acknowledged them all. We've not we kind of bass bypass that today, but thank you for their being here. May their hearts have been touched. Let what we do and what we say throughout this week bring honor and glory and praise to you because you are worthy. You are worthy. And I thank you in the name of Jesus. Would you stand with me this morning and let's sing the little chorus in my life. Lord, be glorified in my life. 
in my home and in this church, Lord, be glorified. 